and back. Today, I'm going to need some volunteers, all right? I know this is going to be a different type of message, but it's something that God has really been working on my life with, and I'm just going to bring it to you. Is that okay? Um, I got anybody that wants to volunteer right off the bat? You want to just come up here right now? Can we do that? It's Randy, come on. All right. I'm going to try to paint this into a picture today so that maybe we can receive it in a way that that sticks. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just hear the Word of God. I want it to stick. I want it to become a foundation, a pillar. This is Randy, by the way. He leads our men's ministry. If you haven't met Randy, this is Randy. Welcome him to the stage, if you don't mind. Just give him a hand real quick. I didn't give you these scriptures um, because I really didn't know if we were going to Hebrews or John. We might end up in both, so have Hebrews 12 on the back burner, Keisha, if you don't mind, and let's hit John chapter number 15, and let me set the stage. Jesus has just dropped a bomb on the disciples. He just told them he's leaving. Chapter 14, y'all know this one? Don't let your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it wasn't that way, I would not tell you so. I'm going to prepare a place for you. In other words, I'm leaving, and if I go, I will come again. And I'll receive you to my, myself that where I am, you can be also. And, and the disciples in panic look at him and say, how do we know the way? Like, how, how can we get to where you are? I mean, don't you want to hunger for God like that? Like, okay, Jesus, where are you and how do I get there? What, what, what is it? And I'm going to tell you this. They're talking physically because they've just spent three and a half years watching him do miracle after miracle and teach in ways that blew their minds. They had seen their lives radically changed. And they had seen miracle after miracle that, that did not seem possible and wasn't possible outside of the power of God being on this man's life. And all of a sudden, he's leaving. And so when he says, I'm going, guess what they say? Me too. Man, wouldn't that be a great attitude if we had it today? Jesus, where are you going today? Because I want to go there too. Jesus, what are you doing today? Because I want to do it too. Where are you going to feed today? Because I want to eat there. Where are you going to preach today? Because I want to listen. Where are you going to be? What if that was our daily mindset? God, where are you going? How do I know the way? And what did Jesus say? Very famous verse. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father but by me. In just a few chapters, Jesus gets betrayed, killed, and buried. Just a few chapters after that, he raises. In the next chapter, and, and, and there's a couple chapters after that, what happens? He ascends. Everything they knew was gone, just like that. Can I tell you this, and maybe this is a word that God has for you today. It's not about what you know about what's going to happen. It's about what you've been taught to be prepared for what's about to happen. It's about God has shown you to ready you and to secure you. Yeah, I'm going to tell you, couples, listen to me. You're not going to learn how to be married in the season when you need to learn it. You're going to learn it probably in a prior season to when you go through difficulty. God's going to give you things that draw you together. Good dates happen before bad dates, right? And good times happen before struggles. And God's teaching you in that season what you need to know for what's about to happen. And for three and a half years, Jesus transformed tax collectors into people of giving. And he turned fishermen into people that fished for men. And he, he turned these people that had different lifestyles prior to Christ into totally radically different people after. Me and my wife were talking about this on the way home yesterday. As we were driving, um, and, 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 and I'm telling you, it, it was really cool. As you think about it, everywhere Jesus went, he was such a wordsmith. He didn't go preach to the farmers about being kings. He preached to the farmers about how to plow a field. He didn't go to Peter and say, I'm going to teach you how to collect money. He went to Peter and said, I'm going to teach you how to fish for men. He knew the audience and knew how to speak in a language they would understand. Can I tell you this right now? Um, don't go into a five-year-old class and try to teach them the deep theologies of God. Hey, there's a holy trinity, and this is what they... Five-year-olds are going to have a mind blown. Go to a five-year-old and teach them about David, trusting God, standing in front of the Goliath, and act that thing out. Why? Because you're speaking to their nature. What's a five-year-old care about? Themselves. I mean, that's true. I mean, they want to have fun. Am I right? A five-year-old wants to play. And so if we brought all our five-year-olds out, if we brought the 40 kids in, uh, in children's church out today and set them down here and we preach to them, they're going to hate it. Would you agree? So is there a way that we should be with children that's different than we should be with adults? Yes, yeah, same truth, same underlying message, but Jesus was so good at that. 
Matter of fact, he's looking at them in this season where they're so connected to him. And guess what analogy he uses? A vine. And he turns in chapter number 15 of John where we'll take our text. Here's these people that are needy and saying, don't leave us. Like, don't go. Like, stay. Peter's even saying, if you're going to die, I'm going to die too. It's, and Jesus saying, hey, all these things are going to happen. Remember Peter saying, no, it will not be so for you. And God, Jesus looks at him and says, hey, get behind me, Satan. Hey, you can't stand in the world. And so when they are so needy of him, he teaches them their dependence on him with this analogy of vine and the branches. So we're going to illustrate this today. Is that okay? Read verse number one. Let's read a few. And then, Randy, I'm going to, I'm going to use you here. Ready? He says, I am the true grapevine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit. And he prunes, all right, now get this. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit. Would you write that down in your notes? That even while you're being good, it's going to hurt. Even while you're doing what's right, there's going to be seasons of hurt. We're going to show you in just a second. It says, you have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am that vine. And you are those branches. And those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. From apart from me, you can do how much? How many of you found that to be very true in your life? Any, any triers in here that have said, I've tried it my own way? Testify. How well did that work out? It didn't. That's why you need church, right? That's why you need Bible studies. That's why you need the Word of God. That's why you need people. Because our own way never, never, never works out. He says, without me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, will you circle my words, my words, my words remain in you? You may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. By the way, it might not be granted in the way you wanted it. Can we just give a little commercial break? Me and someone had a conversation about this right before church. You know, um, I'm not going to go into deep things, but they wanted certain visitation rights with a certain person and didn't get them, but then they ended up getting visitation rights with more people. You know, and it's like, this is the way I was praying, and it didn't work out, and I got angry with God. Anybody ever prayed in a way, and God didn't do it your way, and what happened? You get mad. But what if God says, I want to give you that, but I want to give it to you better? And so instead of giving it to you in the minimal size of what you can imagine, I'm going to give it to you in the, in the size that blows your expectations and blows your imaginations. It's like, you, you want the rainbow, but I want to give you the gold pot on the other end of it. You, 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 you want the happy story, but I want to get you more than happiness. I want to have complete joy. You want the storm to stop, but I want to make you a weatherman. A weather woman to where no matter what the storm is, you're going to survive it because you're going to see it coming and you're going to know how you're going to get through. And on the other side of that hurricane that rocks your world, you're still going to be standing because I'm going to teach you how to build on a rock and I'm going to teach you how to stand true. And I'm going to teach you that, hey, I walk on water and I calm storms too. But I'm going to teach you that I am in you and you can do these things and you can trust these things and you can stand on these things. Why? Because I am God and I am with you. And not only am I with you, I'm in you. I almost thought about launching a series about when God says, I am. What does he say he is? And in this one, we're in an I am of, I am the vine. Say that with me. I am the vine. What's a vine represent? Okay, it represents Jesus. But what figuratively is he talking to us about? What would you say? The vine nourishes isn't it amazing that the vine rarely has the fruit on it? But the vine has everything the fruit needs to be growing on the branch. The vine is selfless. The vine rarely gets the glory. The branches are what produces fruit. I'm going to let Randy be Jesus today. It's appropriate. He's wearing white. He did all this. Like he's, he's, he's decked out. But I'm going to tell you this now. The vine is rooted and the roots are God. And Jesus said, my father which gave you to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck you out of my father's hands. Why? He's rooted. 
And so understand today that God is working through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is working because of Christ to bring you into a relationship with God. He's the vine, you're the what? Branches. So watch this. I need another volunteer. Robbie, I knew it. I knew I could almost call that one. Come on. So let's say, and Robbie, stay there for a second. You got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit goes out on the Father's desire and finds you and introduces you to the one who can totally change you and brings you into this relationship and union that through God and the Holy Spirit, you become connected, if you would, become fused into the vine. And as the vine flourishes, guess what happens to you? You flourish. And as the vine grows, guess what happens to you? And when Jesus raised from the dead and life started flowing through that vine again, all the dead branches were able to be reunited and refused. And by the way, if you ever study the grapevine, they use those tremendously in the Middle East in the time of Jesus. No doubt that's why his first miracle was turning water into wine because wine was such an important import. Get this, he was so creative. He knew that he would get their attention with one of the things they loved the most. And so he takes water that is nothing and hand washing pits that are literally made to bathe in before you get into the house and turns it into the best wine that they've ever had at a party. That's a pretty miraculous miracle. And you know what that miracle represents? That he takes the nastiness of you and he brings it into the pureness of him and what used to be dead and gross now becomes alive and wonderful so that you become the best wine that somebody's ever tasted. Your life becomes the best influence that somebody's ever had. And I am in Him, and He is in me, and He is in the Father, and the Father is in Him, and now we're one. And now we're capable. So if we are imagining a vine today, and by the way, a grapevine that has been infested, my counselor showed me a video a year ago, a grapevine that has been infested and been torn apart. You know what they do to that grapevine? If a bird is nested or if it's become full of bugs or something, they will prune the grapevine, and they will take a healthy branch of the vine, cut it, and they will fuse the broken branch in. And over time, in a three-year process, the branch that was nasty, that could have been thrown away, now becomes one that is united with Christ, and it's fused with God. And the purity of this vine heals the impurity of this one. And Jesus says, hey, listen, I know you need me, but you're going to have me always. Because apart from me, Without me, you can produce nothing. I'm going to join you. Not just to me, but to the Father. I want you to understand something. The Bible says the ones that produce no fruit, they're cast aside. Can I tell you this? A lot of people misuse the scripture and they try to talk about how God picks and chooses. And you know, this person's sin and now they're done. That is not what it's talking about. It's talking about the one that refuses to join. The one that refuses to connect. The one that rejects this relationship. It doesn't have to be you today. Can I tell you this? You don't have to understand how a plant grows to put one in the ground. And you don't have to understand the apple tree to enjoy an apple, do you? You don't have to understand how how something can be produced and reproduced and and it it grow into something great. You, You don't have to understand all that to know that it works and it's good. I don't go and get chicken and wonder about the chicken. Anybody else? When I eat chicken, what am I thinking about? Eating chicken. You know, if it's, if it's deep fried, the better. I mean, KFC, let's go. You know, I, I, I think about what I'm consuming. I never think about the process of it. I don't get in my car and think about the process of ignition. I just, I just flip the switch. You know, I, I, I wonder what it is, how we can go through mindlessly in our lives and trust everything in the world except for Jesus. Somehow when it comes to God and it comes to the gospel, we feel like we have to be experts and theologians just to be able to be a part of it, and that's not true. You don't understand most of the things in the world today, do you? I mean, I don't understand right now that my heart is pumping so that my mouth can move. 
Does that make sense? I don't understand that there's arteries and blood vessels that I don't even know that I have. I mean, start working out and you find muscle groups that you did not know existed. Am I right? Stop working out and you'll find cramps in places you didn't know you could cramp. I mean, the thing is, is there's parts of your body you don't even understand, but you trust it. Please write this in your notes. Stop trying to figure out everything about Jesus before you just start trusting Jesus. And know that part of figuring out Jesus is in the process of trusting Jesus. And as you connect to the vine, then you become capable of producing things. Oh, you become capable of reaching other things. So Robbie, you're 16. Robbie's a junior. Um, Robbie's capable of reaching other people. And God will use this growth to produce a fruit that draws other people in. Now, I don't want to be too elementary today, but let's be real. How many of you have ever walked up to an apple tree, plucked an apple, and realized something else ate it first? You know what I mean? Hopefully you didn't take a bite and realize. And hopefully as you bit, it wasn't still eating it because it's just gross. I remember the first time I shucked corn. I didn't eat corn for a year. I had no idea that all these bugs are in there eating the corn too. And, and, and you say, well, I've never seen, you know, bugs on my corn cob because they break it off. It's such a lie. It looks like it's perfectly cut. You know why it's cut? Because something nasty was on that thing before you ever got a hold of it. And they were just like, hey, we're just going to keep the good part. I remember my grandmother sticking me out there with a bucket and, and, and corn that was still in its ears. And I was peeling it down and I was literally, corn was my favorite. And I'm like, I did, it, was like it, it was almost like watching a Halloween movie. It was horrific. It's like, what's happening? They just stole my hopes and dreams. That night for dinner, they had corn and green beans out of the garden. I ate neither, number one. I was in a total protest because anybody that makes you pick green beans does not love you. All right, especially when they make you break them and string them. They do not love you. That is torture. And they try to make it a game. Like, let's see who can fill their bucket the first. Okay, let's go. And then all of a sudden they get a phone call before cell phones. And they need to be in there where the cord and air conditioning is. And nobody calls you in Kentucky because you have no friends there. And the next thing you know, for the next two hours, they're on a phone call while you're filling up your bucket. That child psychology is dangerous. So you go to dinner and you sit there in your total protest. You know why? Because you know how nasty that stuff was. I was thinking about that the other day. That, that very sorry. And, I, and it was just a memory. It wasn't a spiritual moment. But all of a sudden God made it one. It's kind of how the church looks at people today. Oh, we want everybody to go to church. But once we start shucking them, when we see the nasty that's there, we don't want any part of them. You know what God says? I want to connect you to that vine. And I want to get you healed. Because not only are you going to be healed and you're going to be connected, connect. I'm going to reach out and connect others. Pick somebody. <laughs> yeah. All right, Jason. Did you volunteer or did he just grab you? Okay, good. All right, good deal. All right, Awesome. That was this one moment he could have picked any girl in the building. That's what I was going I know. To That's awesome. And as we're connected to the vine, here's what happens. Watch this. I want you to get this. Satan's going to attack the fruits. He's going to try to keep these from growing. And in our lives, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Somebody give me some. Love, joy, peace. Okay, you got them. All right, there we go. All right. Everybody, I can't keep up with all the mind. All right, you know, they're there. These are the things that as you're connected to the brine, through the Holy Spirit, they start growing in your life. So this guy, let's let him represent love. Let's let, actually let him be a person that Robbie loves. You know what happens? <laughs> Is eventually there'll be friction between you and your fruits. Am I right? Eventually, eventually there'll be a hostility here. And if we're not careful, we think this is where Satan's attacking us. Please put this in your notes. If I, if I don't give you anything else today, get this. Satan never attacks your fruit. He always goes for this connection. Because to break this will naturally kill that. And a lot of times we think, oh God, 
save my marriage where it should be God, grow my relationship with you. Oh God, save my kid when it should be God, deepen my parenting roots in you. Because if we're not careful, we'll start loving the fruit more than we love the Creator. Are you with me? And we will fear losing our fruit. Matter of fact, please write it down. Anything you fear losing, you become controlling of sometimes. We've used this illustration before. If you take a tube of toothpaste and let it represent your money, let it represent your wealth. And by the way, there's different things that God will give you as you're connected to that brine. Let go of his hand. Grab his back. I mean, somebody throw me your keys. Anybody got keys? Let him borrow real quick. All right, throw me your keys. Okay. He'll give you resources. Right? You know, can I tell you this? God's not against you having a good home. God's not against you having a healthy car. God's not against you having opportunities in your life. God will give you opportunities, by the way, connected to the vine. Opportunities will naturally grow. Connected to the vine, opportunities will naturally be there. You'll see them appearing in your life because you cannot be connected to such a life-giving power and not see life producing coming out of you. And so God will grow your resources, but if you're not careful, teenager, listen to me, you'll get that first car and you'll feel like i got to work hard so I can keep it. And the next thing you know, your job and your possessions become everything you're holding on to because you're scared if you don't work hard, you're going to lose it. And what Satan just did is he deceived just like he did Adam and Eve. Step back here so they can see Randy. He comes to Eve and says, did God say if you eat that fruit, you're going to die? Because that's not what God meant. God knows that if you eat that fruit, you'll become like God. So you don't have to hold on to everything God says. You can be like him too. And Eve, without being evil, with good intentions, took a bite of something that corrupted her totally. It wasn't that Eve said, I want to sin. It was that Eve's desire was to be so connected with God that Satan attacked that desire, perverted it, and Eve became so connected to being like God that she took a bite to be impressive, and instead, depression fell. How many of you are with me so far? And so Satan will always attack this connection and try to get you focused on this one. Some of you right now, best thing you can do for your marriage is just to get to Jesus. Best thing you can do for your job is just trust Jesus. Just do today what you can do, trusting that God gave you the opportunity to do it. And while you're there, just pray, God, open my eyes to what it is that you want to show me today. God, what is it that you want to feed me today? God, is, what is it that you want to give me? And what is it that you want me to have? And so you know what? Naturally, when you're connected to the vine, you want good relationships. But beyond that good relationship, you want to go to a good church. Pick somebody. Okay, come on. And so the next thing you know, Robbie's network is growing. And now Robbie's part of a group. Pick somebody. Maddie. Maddie was like, you could have picked anybody else. <laughs> Come on, Maddie. You're in danger if I ask her to pick somebody. Just saying. <laughs> and now Robbie's got a good church. Robbie feels healthy because he's going to a good church. And if he's not careful falls in love with this good church. <laughs> Just leave it there. And man, it's good to have relationships, isn't it? It's good to have friendships. But your church can't be your God. Your church can't feed you like your God. And your church can't heal you like your God. And your church doesn't know you like your God. And your church can't nourish you like your God. And if you're not careful, you can have the best church in the world and dry up and wither. And Satan knows he doesn't have to go after this. He can give you that as long as he gets this. Let's do it in another way. You stay, you two go. Robbie's 16. Do you have a boyfriend? 
Okay, do you have a girlfriend? No, you're not allowed to date till you're 17. All right, here we go. I'm going to leave that there for your mama. Just for a moment. No, I'm just kidding. How many times have we seen this? Youth pastors, parents, you got a teenager that's on fire for the Lord, and then along comes the girlfriend or boyfriend. And you know what? They love them. Can I tell you what you're supposed to do, by the way? As God continues to grow this, and He will, it is your job to take what He gives to your hand. Oh, this is good. And give it back to Him. They're having a very awkward moment. (laughs) But I I, I want you to catch this. It's easier to hold this in him than to hold this on your own. And as God gives you a church, it is your job to bring the people that God has brought into your church or your small group or your workplace and to say, God, I'm going to give them to you. You want to keep fruit in your life? Give it back to God. Let it root in Him. Because I'm going to tell you this now, an apple is enjoyable, but it's a whole lot better to invest the apple. If you were given one apple today and it was the only apple left on the planet, the worst thing you could do is consume it. Even if it's the best, most juicy apple that you could possibly have. The worst thing you could do is eat it. Because to consume it would be temporary and you would lose it. Are you following me today? The best thing you could do with that apple, if it's the only apple in the world, is to plant it in nurturing, harvesting, deep-rooted with mineral soil so that that apple tree could grow and produce an abundance of apples for your future. But apart from me, if you can do nothing apart from him she can do nothing either so let me say this to you can you two just step back there I'll bring you back you two are married can I use you come on one of you connect and the other connect to that are y'all fine with this analogy you getting it you following You cannot depend on him for your relationship with him. Vice versa. You cannot depend on her for your relationship with him. Because if you're dependent on her and she's dependent on you, eventually that's going to hurt. And who the Lord loves, this is good. He prunes. And sometimes something that's so good in your hand, God will come and say, I got to take this away for a little bit, buddy. Because you're going to work on this. And this has got to grow. And it's painful. It's hard. It's hurtful. Are we saying that God's going to cause a divorce? That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is whether it's the keys in your hand or whether it's the word of God in your hand or whether it's a resource in your hand, sometimes God says, okay, listen, grab it with both. God's saying, hey, I see that you've made this everything. So I'm going to have to get this for a little bit. I'm going to have to leave you right there so that you can choose what you're going to love the most. I love you enough that I'm not going to let this become everything you think you are. I love you enough that I'm not going to let this become what you're putting your confidence in. I love you enough that she cannot be your everything and she cannot fulfill and she cannot satisfy. Why? Because she's got to work on her connection too. Because apart from him, she can do nothing. And apart from him, you can do nothing. So, hey, I want you to take a part of him and then let her come get a part of him too. And then watch how God secures you both. You know what I love about it? Have you ever watched a grapevine grow? A grapevine has to have direction. If not, it will totally wrap up itself. And look at this. She's connected to the vine And he's connected to the vine. Isn't it a lot safer when the vine is just growing around you? (laughs) 
I am in him and he is in me and you are in him and I am in you. And I... His prayer, doesn't this give new light to the prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples? Imagine this moment, Father, just as I am in you, I want them to be in you. And just as you and I are one, I want them to be one. But I also want them to be one with you. Jesus did not come so that you could get inspired and, and, and encouraged and emotional and feel like you can do something. He came so that you could fully rely and rest and nurture and grow and be healthy because of Him. So Satan's going to attack this. Because if he attacks this, all this can unravel. Raise your hand if you follow so far. I'm the true vine, and you're the branch. And some of you may sit there and say, well, God took something away from me. Maybe God pruned you. There's a time in my life God pruned us from everything we knew. How many of you have ever been in a pruning season where God did something that totally did not seem fair? God did something that totally did not make sense. But how many of you rebutted on the other side of that season? And looking back now, you say, Thank you, Jesus, for getting that impurity out of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and cutting away. Hey, I'm going to tell you this now. Your car will die. Your possessions will fade. The high will wear off. The drunk, the, 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 the buzz will kill. I mean, all those things are going to die. But those that do the will of God, they abide, abide, abide. You know what abiding means? Abiding is constant. But abiding is secure. Abiding means that it's nourishing at all times. Abiding means it's thriving. And when you're abiding in God, your life is coming together. And God doesn't just want to put you together. God wants to make all things work together in your life so that good can be produced and that you can receive the goodness of God through what He's giving you today. He's crying out. He's calling out. I'm the vine. You're the branch. Connect. 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 And I will grow you. I will increase you. I will turn this type of a relationship into this type of a relationship. And I will turn this type of a church. Into. This type. Of a church. You know our churches should be so safe. For all kinds of people. Am I right? We're rewriting. Jimmy, where you at? Okay. Jimmy, what was the name of that group that you were playing their song this morning? Fleetwood Mac. He just started playing the guitar part, and I'm a sucker for an acoustic guitar. Anybody else in here? I mean, and Jimmy was playing it, and so we decided to write a Christian song to a Fleetwood Mac song. If that offends you, I'm sorry. Just wait till you hear it. Some of you wouldn't even know. I'm not even going to tell you when we do it. But we, all these words started coming. Just in a moment, we got a few extra minutes at the end of a praise team practice. and so I, I mean, this song just started being born when he speaks. And I asked DJ this question. Is it appropriate to put the word whore in a song? Because Jesus spoke to the broken, He spoke to the deaf, He spoke to the lame, He spoke to those that, 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 that could not see the blind, He spoke to those that were demonic, He spoke to those that were in need, He spoke to the whore. And when Jesus spoke to the broken and spoke to the hurting and spoke to the longing and spoke to the whore, nothing stayed the chain. same. So we got this little line. When He speaks, He speaks grace, not shame. He speaks healing. We're safe in the arms of Jesus. And you who are broken, you should be a part of this kind of church. To where from tallest to shortest, <laughs> oldest to youngest, no matter what race, no matter what social standing, no matter what condition, safe. Would you agree with me? We have a lot of churches that are strung out. You know what I mean? A lot of churches that this person has the faith, 
in this person, but this person has a faith in that person, and this person has a faith in these people, and this person has a faith in all of them. And if Satan hurts this guy, what happens to them? Are you with me? So it's this guy's job to bring these guys to him. I think we have a great need in our lives to realize how precious that vine is. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because she's with me. You. I had a teenager, I uh, guess he's not a teenager anymore, young man, adult, saying that I'm in a conversation with an atheist, and an atheist is using the verse that when Jesus returns, the dead in Christ will rise, meaning how can those that be dead be in the heaven and hell right now if the Bible says that he will raise them from the dead? And we had this really great conversation on, hey, here's what it is. To be absent from the body is to be... What is that talking about? Your soul. Rich, come here. Let's do a side illustration. This is not rich... This is the vessel of which rich lives in. That's hard to say. It's the vessel of which rich lives in. This man has a soul. That soul was created by the breath of God. Oh, this is good. And whatever God breathes into existence cannot die. And so to be absent from the body, being present with the Lord means that the soul is eternal. Because the soul came out of the very mouth of God into the nostrils of Adam and the shell of which was Adam became a living soul. So when Rich dies, what dies? His body, the vessel. And that vessel cannot go to heaven. That vessel is marred. And that vessel is impure. And just so you know, we're not talking about rich, so is yours. It's been flawed by sin, amen? It's got scars and battle wounds, amen? It has, it has tested and tasted and felt the world. And not the world as in we're holding flowers and roses. The world is in, you picked up the thing you shouldn't have picked up, you ingested the thing you shouldn't have ingested, you spoke the thing you shouldn't have spoke, amen? That flesh has to die. And I love this. The cross was for the soul. The resurrection for the body. And understand that when Jesus died on the cross, He paid the payment of debts that this soul has racked up. Every sin committed is not held against the body. It's held against what's eternal. And that is the soul. And that soul carries those sins. And that soul carries that scar. And that soul carries that imperfection. And Jesus died for the soul of every single person that's ever lived. And when He died, their sin died too. From the resurrection, Jesus didn't come back the same. Matter of fact, when Jesus came back, can you imagine this? Can you wrap your head around this? The same body, physical body, that could walk through a wall could sit down and ingest a fish. How's that even possible? I mean, I've watched Casper long enough to know that if you go through a wall and you eat, we see what you eat and it comes right out. Anybody else seen Casper too? But when Jesus was raised from the dead, the body was raised. <sighs> To the original intention of how God intended the body to be. And so the body that was now flesh, that used to be in a, a, a corruptible world, is now in the a, an original condition of which God made it. And so when you rise from the dead in the resurrection, your body will be the way that God intended it for it to be. But please write this in your note. It's a good amen. You will not have the same body in heaven. You'll have a perfect one. 
You will not have the imperfections. You will not have the scars of 16 years old. You will not have the, the, the scar of sin and the stink of flesh. You will be resurrected. The soul to be absent from the body goes straight to heaven. But in the resurrection, all those dead vessels will be put back together the way that God intended them to be. And that's the way they'll be forever. And when we stop and we start thinking about this... Jesus died for my soul but was resurrected so that I could be restored to my original intent. Then we start to understand, thank you, buddy, how God can take a pruning and then turn the relationship in to the best relationship you've ever had. That God can take a season of, okay, Phil, I love you enough that I'm not going to let you stay this way. Right, Glenda? That's your statement. I love you enough that I'm going to change you. Let's go to Hebrews 12. Can we do that real quick, Casey? Everybody got got some time in your Bible? Y'all can stay there. Y'all look better than I do. Let me get it here. Hebrews chapter number 12. This is where God had me in my devotions all week. Um, I was at vacation. This is the only chapter he let me read. Verse 5, and have you forgotten the encouraging words? This is where me and God stopped and had a conversation. How is discipline encouraging? Have you forgotten the encouraging words that God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those that he loves. If you're reading King James, you're seeing the word chasten. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure the divine discipline, remember that God is treating you like his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by their father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you're illegitimate and you're not really his child at all. You say, I hate what I'm going through. Hey, well, maybe what you're going through is proof that you are a part of the kingdom. How many of you have ever done something that you hate doing, that you hate that you did? Raise your hand. Come on. How many of you have ever done? How many of you hated the consequences to follow? How many of you hated when maybe you lost opportunities that you used to have and different things, but who the Lord loves, he chases. And when I start looking at this, and this is how we study the Word of God, right? We correlate. How does this pruning in John 15 get confirmed correlation by other scriptures in the Bible? And Hebrews 12 comes in. And he says, hey, who God loves, he chastens. If he doesn't chasten, if he doesn't discipline, you're not his. Verse 9, since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our, our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us. So that we might share in his, say it, holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. Can I say, any teenagers in here grounded right now from your phone and say amen to that? There's two. There's some, there's some hands of testimony in the back of the balcony. Are you grounded from your phone right now? Is that? <laughs> I'm so sorry that you're on stage for that. Is it fun? No. Is it painful? No. I mean, like, it doesn't hurt. I mean, what do you do with your life if you don't have a cell phone? Sleep. <laughs> oh, there you go. You just sleep. All right, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so cell phones still are peace. All right, anyway, here we go. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. But it's worth it. Some of the best prayer you'll ever have in your life is to ask God to prune the things from your life that are keeping you to grow into the areas of life that God wants to take you. Maybe this has become so valuable to you that this as far as your gifts, abilities will grow unless God takes it from you so that you're available for more. You two step down for a second. Y'all reconnect to the vine. Singles, listen to me, please. Maybe this relationship, as good as it is, 
if it's all you're holding on to. Maybe it's keeping you from all that God has for you. And while you're holding on to it for dear life, thinking that she's going to make you happy the rest of your life, maybe she's just a part. And if you would give her back to God, there you go. Hold on. You're able to grow. And she's able to grow. She becomes the wife. As she grows, you grow. And as you grow, she grows. And as she takes her increase that God has given her and gives it back to him, we just keep reproducing. I believe this is how we should bring people to church, by the way. Whether it's this church, the Avenue, or Piedmont First Baptist, or New Market, or, you know, wherever you go, okay? Or wherever at home, if you're watching this later, you go. Maybe instead of trying to give people to your church, you gave people to the Lord. Maybe the kingdom could keep growing. And maybe if we had so many Christians that were saying, okay, God, give me one. Give me one today that I can reach for you. Give me one little boy that I can teach today. One little girl that I can minister to and give to you. And then after I get them to you, I'm going to go find another. And maybe if God has put millions of dollars in your hands and you would just simply give some back to him, maybe that would reproduce and grow. And maybe God would give more to grow. And the more you gave back to him, the more we would go. And imagine if we had a church connected to a vine that was constantly giving back to the vine what God gave. That's where a kingdom comes from. And Jesus said, I didn't come to build a kingdom like you're used to a kingdom. I came to build a kingdom that will have no end. I came to build a kingdom that will go on and on. Why? He's saying, I'm going to connect them. I'm going to connect them. And as I connect them, they will reproduce and grow. And as I connect the next one, it will reproduce and grow. And God, help us. If you're the only one growing in your family, then maybe you're holding on to your family and you need to give them back to God. As I was driving down the road yesterday, My wife was texting me Bible verses. Sitting in the seat next to me. There's a part of me that thinks, what was I saying when she sent me that? You know? Like this little subtle, you need to get back to God. We're in the middle of talking football. Which, because what else do you talk about on Saturday? And all of a sudden, my wife says, can I read you this devotion I just read? And she's reading it, and all of a sudden, it's got a quote in it. And I really needed to hear the quote. Maybe you need to hear the quote, too. She sends it to me. Matter of fact, even as I'm preaching, I can pull up the things she's sending me right now. What am I saying? (laughs) It's often the things that no one sees that result in the things... That everyone wants. That's a pretty good quote. Some of you are connected to a vine and you feel invisible, but God's going to produce something in you that's going to produce a desire in somebody else to want what you have. The joy of the Lord is our what? So as you become more filled with joy, guess what other people want? Joy. And when they see that this relationship, a teenage relationship, can thrive and be healthy and be done right, then maybe it inspires another girlfriend or boyfriend to get to Jesus like a boyfriend or girlfriend has that they've seen. When a marriage can be done that's right, maybe it'll inspire the next marriage to try to do it right. You you understand when a church is doing it right, maybe it can inspire other churches to do it right. Hey, maybe when we realize we don't have to tear down each other, that we should build each other up, that we can bring them to Jesus and so that they can grow. Maybe when our talents don't become something of a competition, but instead become a celebration of, oh my goodness, look what the vine gave you today. He gave you a beautiful voice. Sing, please sing. Oh, God gave you a message. Preach. And instead of sitting there saying, I wish I was that person, we sit there and say, oh, what is God going to do to that one today? Because the vine is strong and the vine has plenty to give and the vine is nurturing. Nobody ever gets good wine from a vineyard that only has one vine. If you ever drove by the vineyards down off of uh, the road heading out of Dandridge, 
What, what is that road called? Chestnut Hill. You come up to the one section. I don't know if it's even still there, but on the left, there's just a rolling hill, and there is vine after vine after vine, and branch after branch. A good bottle of wine doesn't come from one grape. It comes from many. And if the church was connected to the vine, we would realize that that's a lot of good grapes. It's a lot of good fruits that God could use to reach a world that really needs to know him right now. I am the vine. You're the branches. Abide in me. I'll abide in you. And we're going to do something. Sometimes I'm going to have to prune you. Christians, non-believer, let him. This morning I was driving to church. Last night before we went to bed, me and my wife were having a conversation. She said, you got a lot of bitterness you need to deal with. Don't you love it? When somebody can see what you already know. Casey sent a text that um, said, hey, let's do Brandon Lake and uh, what's the other guy's name? Cody Carnes version of too good to not be true. Please listen to it. Tell me what you think. You know when I got that text message? She sent it yesterday. I read it this morning. So here I am driving on my way to church and I put on this song and I start to listen and all of a sudden I'm hearing these words. I've seen cancer disappear. I've seen all these things taken care of. Don't say he can't do it. And it was almost like God saying, will you just let me do it? It's not that God doesn't want to do it. Maybe God just wants you to want him to do it before he'll do it. It's not that God can't do it. Maybe it's just that God wants you to believe he's able to do it before he'll do it. Hey, maybe God's not sitting there saying, I'm going to withhold from you. But maybe God doesn't want to leave you behind. See, God can radically change the world right now with one trumpet blast and one shout shout of an archangel. All God has to do is send Jesus back and everything would change. But maybe you're the lost person that God doesn't want to leave behind. And maybe he's waiting on you because he wants you to be a part of the vine. He wants you to experience the joy of life. He wants you to have the fruit. He wants you to grow. He wants you to know that you're loved and you're valued. He wants you to know that you can be healthy. He wants you to know that your sins can be cleaned. He wants you to know that you can be redeemed. You can be remade. You can be reburned. You can be resurrected. You can be changed. Maybe God's sitting here today saying, I'm pruning you and I'm waiting because I want you to experience what I'm about to do. And so God says... I'm going to take this, and I'm going to wait. And so, please forgive me. Driving to church this morning, I found myself with both hands off the wheel. That's what I'm saying, forgive me. Saying I'm I'm done with this bitterness. I can't do it anymore. God, I can't carry this anger towards people anymore. Does that mean it's gone? Aw. That's what my little girl would say. Aw. Maybe it simply means, oh, that unfortunately there's an area of my life that God's got to prune because while I'm holding on to the bitterness, I'm missing the love. That's why Hebrews says, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows in anybody's life because it'll, it'll make them miss the grace that God has. So as God prunes this, no discipline is enjoyable in the season, but it will reap a harvest of availability to where God can do something great. Church, how focused are you on this? Because if I'm honest in front of you today, I find myself more focused on this a lot. Rather than being focused on what's even given me the ability to do this. I find myself focused on the growth in my life more than the grower. Any me too? 
I find myself sometimes so worried about my son. I forget about my Savior. I find myself feeling like it's my prayers that are going to heal him. When we actually have a healer. And maybe I just need to take what I'm holding so tightly to and give it to him. Instead of feeling like it's got to be through me that God can do it. Stop praying that God starts a revival through you and just start praying that God will start a revival. And stop believing that God's got to use you. Stop thinking you have to be the influencer. Stop thinking you have to be the preacher. Stop thinking you have to be the right song, the right melody, the right words, the right time. Stop thinking you've got to be the perfect husband or the perfect wife or the perfect kid. And realize that there is a God that can handle what you're trying to grow. Just give to him. Just plant back in the vine. And let the vine grow it. While he grows you too. Any me too's on the, I focus more on here. Been on here. Would you slip a hand up? What could God do if we kept one hand connected and one hand always available? And if it becomes full, we connect and surrender again. If it becomes heavy, We allow him to prune and we submit to whatever he does so that God can regrow and strengthen the areas of our lives that will make the next 10 years better than the 10 years you've just lived. Make the next five days better than the five days you've just had. Make the next five minutes more exciting than the five minutes you would have had with this. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Somebody tell me, tell me out loud. What part of the connection is Satan going to hit in your life today? The connection to the vine. How many of you got struggles in your life today? Would you slip your hand up? Would you just raise them? I know they're there. Raise your hand. Struggles, heartaches, griefs, you know, hurts, habits, hangups. You got them. Now I'm going to ask you this. How many of you battled and struggled maybe, uh, and I'm going to admit to this with you, Uh, Maybe with anxiety or depression or anger or resentment or something maybe even in the past few days over something that's happening in your life. Would you slip your hand up? There's a lot of hands up in the air right now. Could it be that the anxiety and everything's here because our focus is more on what is happening or not happening in our life than the connection to Christ in our life? Would you, those that just raised your hand, admit me. How many of you have spent more time thinking about what has weighed you down rather than trying to seek the vine that builds you up? Would you slip your hand up? So imagine what next week could be if today you allowed God to prune and this week you focused more on your connection. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among men. And we beheld its glory. You know what the Bible says? We saw the word. What if this week we spent more time trying to get to know who the vine is than trying to figure out the problems of our lives? Maybe next week if we asked that same question, we would see a shift. Maybe next week as we came to worship, we would have a change in atmosphere. Because I'm going to promise you this. You will never, ever ever feel cheated by growing your connection to Jesus. You will always feel cheated by trying to grow your connections everywhere else. Anybody else have expectations of others that are not getting met right now? Anybody else feel like our world's crazy? Anybody else kind of tired of the hate? Yeah, absolutely. And we can talk about that all day long, but you can't change that. Looking at that, telling it to change. You can change that by changing your view of the vine and your connection to the vine and letting God put desirable fruits on your branch that will draw others to Him. So how many of you are like me today that says, God, there's focuses of my life that need pruning today. Slip your hand up. Maybe with your heads bowed and eyes closed and a hand in the air, you pray that, God. There's areas of my life that need some pruning. 
I'm not going to ask you whether those are habits or hurts. God knows. Take them to him. How many of you would also surrender with me today and say, I need to go back more to the nourisher. I need to learn a little bit more about Jesus this week. I need to focus a little bit more about what Christ thinks this week. I need to really try to bathe into what God says this week rather than everybody else and everything else. Anybody with me say, yeah, God, here I am. I need that. By the way, that's not dependent on God answering a prayer of you saying, God, I want to be more connected. That's dependent on what you're willing to do from this moment forward. You do not have to ask God to connect to you. You've just got to be willing to connect to him. He's the vine. And apart from him, you can not survive this. Apart from him, you can not change this. Whatever this is in your life. Apart from him. You cannot fix it. But in him, isn't that the promise? And we'll close with it. Look at me. Doesn't his word say, if you believe, you can ask anything. And what happens? He'll do it. Saying, okay, God, there is a world around me that my heart is broken for. There are people in my life that I love that I'd love to talk to again. There are things in my life that are out of control that I would love if peace would come in. Any me too's? But God, I love you. And I believe so much in you that I know that that chaos that's over there, you can control. And I know that that relationship over there, you can mend. And I know that that person that's hurting, you can reach. So God, give me more of you. Give me more of you. And more of you. Enough of you. That God, if there's anybody looking at me, that they see you. And that they want you to. That they desire you. And they come to you. And they connect to you. And they're grown by you. You and I will not change America. But I do believe God can but I do believe it takes people, according to those chronicles, right? It takes people, his people, coming to him. I almost preached from Hebrews 1, our 12, 1 today. But then I thought, y'all's Bible study has been in Hebrews for like five months or a year. Yeah. But can we read it? Just the first couple verses in closing. Stand with me so that you know I mean it. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of people are watching, they're not watching you. They're watching what you say you believe in. They're witnesses to what, Glenda, the life of faith. Is it real? I believe people would believe God is real if God was more visible. And you say, well, why doesn't God show himself? He's trying through me and through you. I believe there's miracles God wants to do through his church. I believe that there's things that he wants to do so that people would see. There's witnesses. What's it tell us to do? It's saying God is giving us the attention. There's a huge crowd. There's people that's watching you. Every one of you have influence at some point of your life. Somewhere this week, you're going to come in contact with something or someone that you could influence in a positive way. People are watching So now there's an effort needed on your and I behalf. Number one, strip off. That takes effort, right? When I get home today, I'm going to want to change into my comfortable clothes. My brother-in-law and my wife made fun of me yesterday. I put on a shirt and I said, does this look okay? And they said, yeah, it looks great. It's another black shirt. (laughs) You know, like it's even the same brand. But I want to throw on my comfy shorts. And in order to throw on something, what must I do? Doesn't naturally happen, does it? You say, well, God, I'm going to strip off the weights that are carrying me down. You're not just going to walk out of here with no anxiety because you said you were going to walk out of here with no anxiety. You're going to have to actually put some effort into making sure you don't let anxiety rule your life this week. So you got a court date coming up. And I know some of you do. Just be honest. 
Trust what God can do in the judge. And trust what God can do beyond the judge. If the judge doesn't do what God wants to do, God will make it happen another way. And don't spend the next day or two trying to figure out what the judge is going to do. Because just know that no matter who's sitting in power or in the White House today, their throne doesn't sit as high as your Savior's does. You're going to have to, and I'm going to have to, listen, I'm going to have to spend intentional time that when my mind wants to go to what makes me anxious, I need to take it back to who? Jesus. When the shame comes in, maybe that simple song, what can wash away my sin? Yeah. Your apologies don't even take it away. Oh, but his precious blood will. What can make me whole again? So when anxiety comes into your mind, your mind has to go back to who? Strip off the weight. Then look at the next part, verse 2, and we're out. Especially sin. It so easily trips us up. Anybody in here got a temper problem? How many get messed up by that temper problem? Strip off the sin. It easily trips us up. Maybe it's lying. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it is pornography. Maybe it is something bigger. Maybe, and by the way, there's no big, no little. Sin is sin. Oh, you know what I love about this verse, though? You have the power over it yet again. God doesn't say, hey, lay down the weight and then oh, deal with the sin. No, God says, take it off. Get, get rid of it. You can, you can throw it down right now. Meaning unholy can be holy in this moment. From dead to life in this moment. That you can transform. That you no longer have to starve yourself to find, try to feel good. You no longer have to look at a mirror to get your worth. You can go eat a burrito today, smile ear to ear, and be just as beautiful. You don't have to have that eating disorder anymore. You don't have to have that lying problem anymore. You don't have to worry what people think anymore. Hey, lay down that weight and get rid of that sin. How do you get rid of that sin? What can wash away it? Jesus. Can we get connected to that vine and it says, hey, 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 and then let's do this. Number one, lay down, strip off, and then three-letter word that will change your life. Ready? Run. Run. Don't stand still. You're saying, I want God to show me what to do with my life. Get in the Word of God and find something you can do with this day. Get in the Word and find something you can do in this moment. Hey, I'm going to tell you this right now. If God hasn't told you to go talk to anybody, then just stop and praise God right where you are. Do something where you are. Do not have a faith that stands still this week. Constantly be looking for ways to express your faith and show God's glory and to reach out. Run with endurance. It's going to be a long race. Pace yourself. Get in there. Let's go. I read on the vacation. Um, I realized that I had to kind of teeter-totter between two different sizes of shirt. And, and I, I sat there and I thought to myself, yeah, I, I, I'm going to make some changes. And, and I started reading and I started looking at some things to make some changes. And one of the things they said, one of the number one reasons we burn out on workouts is we start too hard too fast. So maybe you don't try to become John the Baptist today. And maybe you don't try to become Peter and walk on water. But maybe you just have enough faith to get in the boat with Jesus or just to do the one thing he asked you to do. Maybe today, and let's put it into a layman's term, right? A layman's term means let's put it into practicality. Don't expect your marriage to heal today, but be nice. Just be kind. And see what happens. Forgive. And see where that takes you. Don't sit here and, I'm going to read the whole word of God this week. You'll get nothing out of it if you're trying to speed read. But maybe you just read a verse. Or like this week, Hebrews 12, a chapter. Who the Lord loves, he disciplines. 
And so the opportunities that I've lost in my life that were very much hurting, I was able to sit at one point in my life and say, okay, God, if this is what you need to do to open the other doors, take it. And I really got mad at Casey. Because two weeks ago, three weeks ago, Casey said, I really want to sing this song and I want you to do it. And it was that if less of me means more of you, take everything. And I sang it and he's doing it. And it's like, maybe I shouldn't have sang it, right? But then you read that scripture and it's like, yeah, you should have sang it. You should have believed it. Because when I take, I don't take without giving back. I don't remove without healing. I don't, I don't wound, I grow. So run with endurance. The race that God has for you. Let's get to the vine this week. Amen? Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for the vine, your son. God, I'm going to need reminded of this in about five minutes. And when my insecurities start kicking in, God, I'm just, I'm just going to need you to let that Holy Spirit haunt me with these truths. So God, help my complaint turn into praise as I recognize your pruning and help my my joy to be restored as I recognize your presence, your discipline as something that's good for my life. And whatever is in my life, God, it's keeping me from what it is you want or what you have. I surrender it. Reveal it, prune it, take it. It's yours. I love you thankful for you. May this echo in our hearts this week. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.